Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming today. It's my great pleasure to uh, begin this uh, wonderful symposium, uh, Translation and the Making of the uh, Arab American um, Community. Uh, and I'm really grateful to the scholars and presenters and activists and writers who will be joining us today. Uh, the uh, main uh, host of this event is um, the Department of Comparative Literature. Uh, it says a symposium co-sponsored by Arab and Muslim American Studies, Comparative Literature and Middle East Studies, with Comparative Literature led by our friend and colleague, Yopi Prince, is the, the main um, uh, funder and provider through uh, a, a wonderful Mellon grant for which uh, had included several symposia on translation in the Midwest. And this is one of them. And as director of uh, Arab and Muslim American studies, I'm uh, delighted that we were uh, uh, as a program helpful uh, in supporting this, uh, this event. Uh, the thought of uh, translation uh, as an important component of, uh, of the making an evolution of the uh, Arab American community, um, uh, maybe can be encapsulated in a just a small story. Some of you may have seen, I haven't seen it, if it's come out on an article by Diana Abu Jaber about Mensif. Did that come out in the New York Times? Did you see? Yes. And she may have seen some of you. Or did, did you meet her? Did you see? Okay. Okay. So, and, and uh, Sally, as you know, is uh, lived in Jordan and knows all about Mensif and so on. Uh, anyway, as Diana was uh, looking up or trying to research Mensif, she's in Florida, where apparently they can't uh, find anything about that. So she came here, she came to the, in a way, the capital of Arab America to find about Mensif. Uh, it, it's unfortunate that there wasn't um, enough uh, for her to find. She did find one a uh, restaurant where I met her at. And um, I remember in our conversation, we talked about, uh, you know, the evolution of this uh, food. And it turns out that there were like, the Bedouin communities in Jordan, in the Gulf, and of course, also in Libya, that rice is very important. Rice is not part of the, the it's, not, it's not really grown a lot in the Arab world, but it is somehow ended up being this, um, this main uh, offering. And so we speculated about uh, where this came about and uh, compared the Bedouin food and habit history. I just sent her a video of, uh, of the Bedouins of Libya and how they celebrate and how they have a, a version of that dish. So this kind of conversation perhaps uh, could not take place outside of our community. And it does involve translating and figuring out. And it is in a way within even this translation, you can have sort of comparative Arab experience. In a way, when we talk about translation as uh, an Arab American experience, it's not just that the, the Arabs or uh, Americans are translating themselves in, in broad terms to the uh, their fellow Americans, but they're also trying to learn uh, of themselves. And as you know, Dearborn is, um, a uh, mix of folks from Iraq, various generations and uh, uh, backgrounds. You have uh, 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 people who are uh, Chaldeans, and then you also have uh, uh, Shia, mainly from Iraq. Then you have Palestinians who had been in this area for a long time, Lebanese, Syrians, all of them are um, comparatively translating their backgrounds to each other and also trying to find a sort of a shared background to translate their their um, perhaps legitimacy uh, as, as human beings, as citizens to the community. One part of the conversation was um, we wanted to talk to the, uh, to the, uh, to the restaurant, the chef. And, uh, and I noticed that he was um, really kind of reticent. He didn't really want to say a lot. He was a Kurd from Syria making mensaf, which again, doesn't always really like, what do the Kurds have to do with it? But that's also part of what happens in Arab America is that even if you're, something is not part of your particular Arab experience can be, can be added to it. But he didn't really want to answer many questions. I told him that she's a writer and a journalist and wants to ask questions. And he answered a few and says, I'm busy. We can't find any waiters. And that part too, 
is part of their Arab American experience, fearing questions, uh, fearing uh, figures of authority, and also uh, not necessarily being heard, but be sort of being probed and being investigated. So that's um, part of uh, what happens in translation to, 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 to experience translation and the making of Arab American community has also uh, been shaped by encounters with authority. And as we saw, uh, maybe since the first Gulf War, but even before uh, that, he, he not here and elsewhere, uh, encounters of uh, Arab Americans with US authorities, whether it's the LA-8 or others, or the folks in Buffalo who were uh, arrested and, and many, many others, uh, uh, attitude of American uh, security forces and law enforcement has always been uh, and, you know, complicated is a soft word, has we've been surveilled uh, uh, as such, we've been watched uh, very particularly for no given reason whatsoever. And the lawsuits that we're hearing about now, Los Angeles, uh, there was one case in uh, Chicago, the film you may have seen, uh, the feeling of being watched. So that stuff is also being mediated through translation. Uh, I also, I, I don't know why I'm bringing this up, but the, you know, the Arab Americans have been coming here for a long time. Some of you may remember, uh, or maybe have heard that in fact, and Sally would maybe know this than uh, anyone uh, more, but everybody would know, is that um, there were Arab Americans here for maybe nearly 200 years. Uh, as soon as coal steam ships were cruising around uh, the Great Lakes, there were Yemenis working there, throwing coal into these engines. To, to um, The idea then, and this is where the word coolie maybe comes from, the idea is that these Yemenis, because they come from hot countries, you can throw them into the coal room, they would be able to manage the heat, which can reach up to 120 degrees be, uh, inside these engine rooms. And that's part of our experience. Imagine to have our bodies to be different, to uh, be able to handle more suffering or less than others, and so on. So that's part of the story. The other part of translation in the making of our community is what I've um, learned from Hani's work, which is the fact that Arabic existed and was a part of mediating the Arab American experience for a long time. And Arabic was here also to address uh, the news of home. Arabic was um, the language of staying in touch, uh, of maintaining connections. And if we think of now we have uh, connections to the internet, somehow these folks who were here, whether they're agents of imperialism or not, they did uh, actually um, uh, stay in touch with the politics of the region. And then uh, in some ways you could say, uh, because they did stay with Arabic and did not quite were ready to translate their heritage to their, their children, or as uh, Alexa Naf says, they kind of uh, uh, assimilated themselves to oblivion. And perhaps the, the difference maker would have been translation where at somewhere a, a middle language would have kept uh, some of the roots alive. This is a lesson that the Arab American community has possibly learned. And if you come here to us in Dearborn in our area, or even to Minneapolis, which is, you know, has uh, broadly speaking, uh, 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 an Arab American community, you are coming into a, uh, not a melting pot necessarily, but uh, um, a market of exchanged uh, evolving ideas that are uh, working towards uh, a medium. The specter that haunts this uh, sort of utopic, energetic uh, uh, state of existence where Arab and English are, Arabic and English are kind of flourishing is the, the surveillance and security that is eavesdropping on these conversation and still haunts us. So we are come to this conversation with a lot of excitement, with a lot of uh, to learn from each other, but also we will not neglect the fact that we've been overheard all the time. So even here. So at any rate, welcome and thank you for joining us today.
and I look forward to uh, the panel. And I want to give special thanks to, to Graham Liddell, who uh, has been the, he, the, the engine behind this uh, conference. And uh, I'm so glad to see it being pulled off so wonderfully. So thank you, Graham, and thank you, everybody. And uh, we can get started now. Thank you. Hi, so uh, my name is uh, Hassan Abu Uh Thank you all for coming here today. It's my pleasure to moderate this panel, um, which is titled Translation for Community Needs, Public Health, Education, Civic Engagement. Uh, thank you to Arab and Muslim American Studies, Comparative Literature, and Middle East Studies for organizing this event. And again, thank, uh, special thanks to Graham Little and Khaled Matawa, uh, Khaled Matawa for all the behind the scenes work. Um, it's really nice to be here. So I'd like to actually introduce our first panelist to you today, uh, to my far left, Anissa. Um, Anissa Sahoba serves as Director of the Youth and Education Department at Access, as well as the Integration Lead for the agency. The department provides adult education, early childhood and parenting education, supplemental education services for youth, leadership, health and fitness, community organizing and civic engagement, and college and career preparedness programs. Within her role, Anissa develops vital programming for youth and their families, builds bridges with various agencies and key stakeholders to maximize impact, and leads efforts to secure millions of dollars in funding for these programs. Her vision is to empower youth and families with the knowledge, skills, and experience needed to become healthy, productive and engaged members of their community. Uh, Anissa earned her bachelor's degree in secondary education and her teaching certification from Wayne State University. She earned a master's degree in adult instruction and performance technology from the University of Michigan. Uh, the title of Anissa's talk is Equitable Access to Education and Human Services Through Language Access. Thank you, Anissa. Thank you, Hassan, and uh, thank you to Khaled, Graham, and everyone else who put together this uh, symposium. Can everyone hear me okay? Um, so, you know, when I saw the title of this symposium, I was really excited because for me, it's, it's really personal. Um, just as a brief introduction, um, I immigrated with my family to the U.S. in the late 80s. I was five years old, and um, there were a couple of moments even back then where I was very much aware of not being able to understand what's happening around me. You know, my, my first memory of that was at the airport when I heard, you know, um, English being spoken. And I remember thinking, these people talk so fast. I, I can't decipher when, you know, a sentence begins and ends. Like I was aware of that even back then. Um, and then my other memory early on is when I was in the first grade. So I was in the first grade and I didn't speak the language yet very well. I was, you know, at home with my parents and they didn't speak the language. Um, we immigrated to the south end of Dearborn, for those of you who are familiar with it. So, you know, a lot of immigrants in that neighborhood. So I didn't really get the language before going to school. And um, I remember during Thanksgiving, the teacher asked us to... Um, to bring uh, canned goods. And, um, you know, the way this is connected is when I think of language access, it's not just the language, it's everything else. It's context, it's frame of reference, it's, it's all of those things, right? And um, where we come from, so I, I, we immigrated from Yemen. Those of you who are familiar, it's, you know, south of Saudi Arabia. And we were actually not living in the city. We were living in a really remote village called Al Riyashia. And where we come from, food drives, canned goods, that whole idea is not something we're familiar with. Of course, there's a lot of generosity that happens. You know, we cook food and we give, give it to people. Canned goods is, is not something that we are familiar with. And I remember the teacher telling us, you know, we're having a food drive, bring canned good, bring uh, cans is what I heard. And all I knew was that in the middle of our tables, we had um, Maxwell House cans. And what we put in there were Crayons, pencils, rulers, that type of thing. So I just automatically assumed um, this is what we were, the teacher needs more cans. 
Um, so, so I got home and I told my parents, you know, I, I need cans and I explained to them why. So we we're sitting there. It was a family effort. We were, you know, um, emptying out the baba beans and <laughs> the chickpeas <laughs> cans and, you know, and I was really proud of myself. I had probably five or six cans and, you know, normally my father drives me to school that morning. I said, you know, I, I want to walk to school so everyone can see that I have all of these, you know, empty cans. So I got to school and I gave them to my first grade teacher and, um, and she asked me, what's this? And I said, well, they're, they're cans. You asked for cans. And, um, and I remember her calling the teachers out in the hallway and showing them my empty cans. And I was aware that they were making fun of me. I knew that I didn't understand everything, but I knew that I did something quote unquote wrong. And, um, and then she said, that she was going to throw them away. And I said, no, those are my cans. I'm going to take them back home. And so, you know, that was kind of my second memory of, you know, realizing I didn't know what was going on and, um, and really being made to feel less than, you know, at the time, I was almost six years old at that point. So, um, you know, those things sound sad, but really they helped shape me. So, you know, um, I'm glad you guys laughed. I laugh about it now. Um, so, um, but, you know, that's what led me to doing, you know, the work that I'm doing now um, that Hassan just um, just uh, mentioned. And, um, you know, it's what kept me with the organization that I'm in. So I'm going to begin just by that's OK. That if, I'll just mention um, our our vision at Access. I think a lot of you are probably familiar with um, with Access. Am I supposed to control it from here or? Oh, oh thank you. No, that's OK. Okay, we're doing something wrong here. It's okay, I can, I can move on. Um, so Access, for those of you who are not familiar, is a human service organization. Um, it's been around for 50 years. We actually celebrated our, uh, thank you, our 50 year anniversary last year um, because of the pandemic. Unfortunately, we were not able to, um, we weren't able to celebrate the way we wanted. Um, but yeah, we've been around for 50 years. Access started as a tiny storefront organization where, you know, volunteers, five volunteers came together and they really wanted to help immigrants navigate everyday life. Um, so it started off with these volunteers. And then now decades later, um, Access really started looking at what do communities really need to thrive. So, you know, beyond how we started, which was just helping immigrants read mail or turn on, you know, uh, utilities, maybe register their kids for schools, it evolved into looking at, you know, again, what do communities need to thrive? Um, what do families need in order for them to get to that next level in life? And um, obviously, you know, education is a big piece and the Youth and Education Division pretty much started almost, you know, um, a couple of years after Access was established. And of course, um, you know, communities need to be healthy to thrive. So our Community Health and, Health and Research Center was established. It's now a division that has over 70 programs and services from physical health to mental health to substance abuse. Um, a domestic violence unit, there's a clinic there, um, and just a whole host of, of programs to, to keep children and their families healthy um, mentally and physically. And of course, healthy families need to be working. So um, our employment and training division, um, our workforce development was uh, established well or almost 30 years ago. Um, and that has everything from um, job training to job placement to, um, you know, really helping individuals navigate the, the, the job market. And, um, and then we have social services. So in order for individuals to take advantage of all of these programs and services that I talked about, there needs to be, um, you know, resources that help them meet their basic needs so that they are in a place where they can seek out jobs, get better education, and so on. Um, and then, of course, you know, Access also has the three national institutions. Um, the Arab American National Museum, which you might be aware of, is an institution of Access. Um, the Center for Arab American Philanthropy was uh, was developed by our our uh, now CEO Mahafraj, 
And um, what's really neat about the Center for Arab American Philanthropy is it works with individuals, Arab Americans across the nation to give more strategically um, to, um, you know, to areas that impact Arab Americans and others. And, um, and then our National Network for Arab American Communities is our third national institution. We work with 27 institutions across the nation in 13 states, helping them um, develop their various capacities in fundraising, program development, advocacy, and so on. So that's access in a nutshell. Um, our vision and mission are, are up there. And we've just completed our uh, five-year strategic plan. And it's, as you see there, So let me just um, jump into uh, to language access. So I think, you know, I mean, obviously the work at access was, was rooted in this. That's why it was established to help immigrants, you know, um, navigate not just everyday life, but, you know, navigate their, their journeys from, you know, one, one level or one point to the other. And um, there's, there's a definition there. I know uh, people have different definitions of what language access might be, but in a nutshell, it's, it's simply providing um, individuals who don't speak the language well with uh, reasonable access to services, same services as English speaking individuals. So, you know, at Access and many other places, we provide language access because it's the right thing to do. You know, if we want individuals to truly um, you know, um, take advantage of the resources and programs we have, we need to make sure that they're understanding what those are and how to, you know, how to access them. So, but it's, it's also the law. Um, so it's, I won't read it, but it's, uh, it's what you see there. Title six of the Civil Rights Act. Um, and, you know, I think, what a lot of people don't don't realize is um, all of the programs and services, even the programs that we don't get directly from, you know, these departments here, are are under that law. So even if a portion of the you know um, the grants or the proceeds are from any one of these um, departments, we're we're legally required to to abide by by that law. Examples of language access um, at Access. Um, so we do everything from, so at Access, we speak 17 different languages and we are very intentional about that. Um, you know, we started off with just the um, Arab Americans, but over the decades, we've started serving everyone who walks through our doors, immigrants and non-immigrants. And so, um, you know, we found the need for us to hire staff who speak all of these different languages. Um, so that's that's how we you know we didn't set out to have staff speaking 17 different languages but that was that was the need and so that's that's what we we did our information is translated into various languages and the languages that they're translated in really depends on the community that we're in um you know in dearborn obviously it's um it's arabic we do a lot of work in detroit in some areas where there's a large spanish-speaking population so we make sure that um, you know, what we have is, is translated into that language. Um, we have interpreters, everything that we do when we have town halls, when we have, you know, even when clients come in for the services, we always make sure that there's someone there who, who speaks that language. The other thing that we do is we, we make sure that our clients know that when they're going to court, for example, when they're going to seek health care, um, they, they have access to interpreters there and we help them, you know, navigate that process, whether it's, you know, requesting it or, um, you know, and, and also making sure that they know they can get it in the dialect that they speak. They just have to request it because all we, we all know that dialects in Arabic, you know, are almost, they sound like different languages in some cases. Um, so, what you see here, and I know Karen through uh, your office, you have updated numbers, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, it's language access is obviously important across the nation, but in Michigan, it's especially important because of 
the large percentage of, of immigrants that we have. I mean, look at, you know, just the Tri-County area, it's fairly significant um, immigrant population. So, um, you know, I, I mentioned Michigan's immigrant um, communities impact on the economy because we sometimes hear that, you know, immigrants drain the system, you know, having language access is, um, you know, it's costly, it takes a lot of money. So, you know, we, we like to explain, and again, this is from 2014, I know there are updated numbers, but, you know, as you can see here in 2014, Michigan's immigrant community earned 19.6 billion and provided 14.2 billion in spending power. Um, the employment rate of immigrants is 18.6 higher than US born Michiganders. Um, in the same period, immigrants provided 1.5 billion in state and local taxes, 3.8 billion in federal taxes, 1.9 1.9 billion of that was in social security taxes. So, you know, although, so immigrants have earned, you know, whatever it costs to make sure that information is translated or interpreted into their language, they've, they've earned that. They've, they're, they're paying into that system. Some more information on um, immigrant communities and our impact on the economy. While immigrants make up just 6.2% of Michigan's population, um, the New American Economy reports that immigrants make up 30% of Michigan's doctors, 28% of software developers, and 27% of its agriculture workers, 22% of uh, mechanical engineers. I included that last piece because we're here at U of M. 70% of pans are produced by the University of Michigan. And this was back in 2011, so I'm sure that number has changed. So um, just a little bit more information on how access as an organiza organization meets the needs of limited English proficient population. So, you know, we, we do that when clients come in, you know, no matter which point of entry, whether they come in through the education unit, health unit, social services, or workforce development, it's again, making sure that they are understanding the information that's given to them, that they're understanding how to navigate the various systems. Because, you know, oftentimes clients get, get stuck, you know, if they don't know how to seek out a service, then they can't get into these various levels, whether it's, you know, um, their pathway to, to higher education or post-secondary education. Or, you know, sometimes they might not even seek health care because they weren't able to get insurance because they didn't understand that process. So there are a lot of barriers to seeking out all of these different resources. And we feel that our role is to make sure that we remove those barriers and to make sure that clients and customers and patients know that these resources are available to them, not just at Access, but across the state. Um, it's, it's the law. Wherever they go, you know, in terms of, you know, um, courts and, and healthcare and so on, they they have the opportunity to get these services. So, you know, I can talk forever about about this topic because I'm really passionate about, especially the education piece. Um, but I know that we're limited on time. Um, so, you know, while so much is happening and a lot of great things are happening around language access, there's, there's still a lot to be done. You know, I think about education, for example, you know, in Dearborn, we're, we're lucky, you know, we have a lot more resources, but I know that I get calls from across the state, you know, from uh, school districts who say, you know, we, we have these, you know, new immigrants and we need someone to translate. And they're asking us to translate by phone, you know, and sometimes their, their IEP, um, meetings and, you know, um, for, for special needs kids. And, you know, I can't help thinking, you know, it's, it's better than nothing, but how much is lost when you're doing it by phone? You know, there's that human aspect that, that is lost there. Um, you know, how much is lost in, in translation? Because I might have someone who can speak Arabic, but if I don't know enough about the child and their background and what dialect they're spe they speak, I'm not going to be able to provide the best service. So, 
you know, I think while many school districts know that they should be providing this and they have the best intention of providing this, what I see that's lacking is a real intentional language access plan, you know, that really defines what does that look like? Just using school districts as an example, what does that look like in our district? You know, what are the strategies that we have? How are we training our staff to be able to do this? How are we ensuring that, um, you know, the quality of translations and interpretation is, is what it needs to be? Um, you know, we've, a, a lot of us do home visiting, for example, you know, um, visiting homes of early childhood um, uh, families. And, you know, we've heard of programs where they take, if I'm the social worker, for example, doing a home visit and I don't speak Arabic, I might take an interpreter with me. You know, and I just think about how much is lost there, because if I have a relationship as a social worker with the family, he or she might be telling me things that they might not be telling, you know, a third party or someone is, you know, who they normally don't see, you know, or again, if the interpreter doesn't have that background, how much is lost in, in translation? So I think about these things and, you know, there seems to be a lot of efforts you know, happening, um, you know, again, because it's the law, but also because I, I really think that, you know, people have the best intentions, um, but there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of, you know, what does that really look like if it's, if it's quality interpretation and quality translation. Um, so I, I'll just stop there. I'm, my 15 minutes are probably up. Um, I don't know if we're taking questions now or no, I think we'll take questions after at the, the end. at the end. Yeah, yeah. but thank, uh, you. thank you so much, Anissa. Thank you. That, that, that was really fascinating. Um, our next speaker is Karen Felipe. Uh, Karen is the director of New American Integration with the Office of Global Michigan. She has been working in the field of immigration law and immigrant refugee integration uh, for over twenty nine years. Karen began her career by serving as the immigration and state department specialist for U.S. Senator Don Regal. She then worked in various law firms for 20 years, developing and managing employment-based immigra uh, immigration practices before joining the state of Michigan. She has presented at numerous conferences and webinars, both locally and nationwide. Karen is passionate about immigration and immigrant refugee integration, and she is very active in promoting the cultural and economic benefits that immigrants and refugees have on communities and making Michigan a more immigrant-friendly state. Uh, she has a Bachelor of Arts in Anthropology from Michigan State University. The title of Karen's talk is State Level Advocacy for Improved Language Access. Thank you, Karen. Thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be here with everyone today. Thanks so much for having us and for Graham for putting this together and, and um, everyone who helped put this together. We appreciate um, being asked to, to speak with everyone today. And it's also great to be here with not only my state agency partner, but also one of our very close nonprofit partners. Um, who we've worked with for a long time. So I want to start off and talk a little bit about our office. Um, the Office of Global Michigan was created in early 2014 as the Michigan Office for New Americans by then Governor Rick Snyder. Um, under Governor Whitmer, our name changed to the Office of Global Michigan, but we have the same work and the same focus. Um, we were created with an, an economic integration focus. Um, we very much understand and appreciate that there are social justice and immigrant rights issues that come in with the work that we do, but um, the, the primary focus of our work is from that immigrant economic um, integration perspective. Um, so our office, again, we support immigrant and refugee um, initiatives for the state. We coordinate with state agencies who provide services uh, or benefits to immigrants and refugees, and we try and minimize or remove barriers to accessing those state-level programs and services. Uh, we analyze and make recommendations to the governor on uh, federal programs and policies um, and state uh, federal state policies and programs as well uh, as they relate to um, immigrants and refugees. We lead our state refugee services office. So our office doesn't necessarily do refugee resettlement directly, but we are the administrative oversight office for refugee resettlement within the state of Michigan. We also run the Michigan International Talent Solutions Program, which really strives at um, that equitable access piece to state level services and programming. So not only striving to provide equitable access to that state level service and programming across the board, we work with a lot of our state agency partners on that but also striving to make sure or striving to ensure that um, 
if an individual walks into a Department of Health and Human Services office, let's say in Dearborn, where there may be um, Arabic speaking staff, if you also walk into a DHHS office in Flint, do you have the same type of access to language if you need it? It might not be the actual staff who speaks the language, but trying to ensure that that language access is there. And again, so you're getting equitable services no matter what offices you're going into at our state partners. Um, we really strive to make Michigan a more welcoming state to immigrants and refugees. That's something we see is woven into what we do every single day. Um, we convene two stakeholder groups, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about them because I'm going to weave in how they've been really helpful for, um, for us over the years. Um, one group is called our Ethnic Cabinet. It's a group of ethnic chambers, ethnic business organizations, and our three state ethnic commissions who are actually within our office. There is a Hispanic Latino Commission, uh, Asian Pacific American Affairs, and a Commission on Middle Eastern American Affairs. Again, they're all under the umbrella of our office. Um, and again, our ethnic cabinets are ethnic chambers, ethnic business organizations, and some smaller ethnic community um, service nonprofits. And that group, we convene about three to four times a year. It's really a continual exchange between our office and those um, communities to try and both share information to them on either what's happening within our office or introducing new state programming or services to them, and also hearing from those communities about where they may see issues arising or having concerns or, again, maybe some of these barriers to accessing services. And then we also convene a group called Global Michigan. They were named under our prior Michigan Office for New Americans name, so um, but we just didn't change the name of the group. Um, our Global Michigan group is really more about sharing immigrant and refugee integration best practices statewide, and that group includes economic development organizations at both the um, at county level. It includes city and county uh, government officials, universities, nonprofit service providers, some of our state agency partners. Um, our refugee resettlement agencies and, and a whole host of others. And both of these are state statewide um, groups um, that we've been convening since our office was created back in 2014. And then again, as I mentioned, we um, uh, oversee our three state ethnic commissions. Um, I think Anissa brought up some really good points. And one of the ones that I really want to try and, um, I guess, stress is that interpretation and translation does not equal language access. Um, and we think that's really important to remember. And we are constantly trying to remind our state agency partners of that. Um, the other thing is the work that we do doesn't solely focus on the Arab American population. So I'm going to talk more about the work we've done broadly, but I will also weave in obviously specifically how some of it does relate into the um, Arab American population. Um, but again, we, we really advocate and strive to um, work with immigrants and refugees broadly across the state. Um, I'm also going to focus a little bit more on some of the emergency response from the state in terms of language access. Um, and there are two in particular that I've been very involved in. And the first was the Flint water crisis. Um, when the Flint water crisis first hit, um, one of the first things that the governor's office did at the time was identify the primary languages spoken in about a three to four county area around Genesee County. And um, that was Spanish, Arabic, Hmong, and Mandarin. I don't know about anybody else, but Hmong actually surprised me. Didn't realize that was one of the larger communities in that area. Um, even though, again, we do a lot of work with immigrant and refugee communities, but sometimes you don't realize some of those things. Um, anyway, so um, our office coordinated all the translation of materials under the Flint water crisis. So things like door hangers, water distribution site information, health forms, um, health information, um, you know, food distribution, Im impact on children, et cetera. Um, we, again, helped coordinate all that information. And the other thing that we did um, was we brought to the attention of um, the governor's office, um, and I know this was also mentioned a little bit earlier, was really the need to um, minimize the um, minimize any partnership we might have with federal government at that time, in particular ICE and CBP. Um, we didn't want to discourage anyone from getting access to water um, and from um, being able to take advantage of any of the um, services being provided at that time by the state. And so um, we, the governor's office worked with um, the federal, our federal partners to ensure that any of their assistance was only around distribution purposes. There was no enforcement activities happening during that time. And we also really tried to even minimize their, their engagement at all in that, in that process. Um, and as I'm sure you're aware, the states don't have control over the federal government, but I will say they were very um, accommodating during that time. So we were very appreciative. Um, 
We also engaged a lot with our community partners at that time to help disseminate information um, into the community. Um, and, um, you know, fast forward to March of 2020, um, and we have a, a pandemic that impacts the state as a whole and not just a region of our state. And so one of the first things that our office did was advocate for that language access piece um, from, from the first moment they were getting ready to send the whole state government home. And we knew this was a, an issue at the time. I know people thought it was only going to be for a few months, um, but we still advocated um, very strongly for language access. And the other thing that we did was we advocated not just for language access for those communities who had larger populations. So Oftentimes you might hear around language access that, oh, let's look at census data and let's look to see what percentage of the population speaks that language. Um, and so we did that and, and it, this will come up every time. Spanish and Arabic are the top two in the state. However, um, we again advocated that the governor has three ethnic commissions and we strongly encourage that there should be at least one language for each of those commissions. So we went to our MAPAC, the Michigan Asian Pacific American Affairs Commission, and said, okay, for your communities, what would be the primary language that you would need, um, you feel would be of need? And they said simplified Chinese. So we had identified Spanish, Arabic, and simplified Chinese for the pandemic. But then we also said, okay, those are the top probably speakers of those languages. However, we also know that in the last three to five years, we have refugee arrivals who really, in reality, a lot of our refugee community are more of the limited English proficient um, individuals. And so um, we, I can, he works for me, so it doesn't, isn't hard for me to connect with him, but connected with our state refugee coordinator and said, okay, how, what are the largest number of refugees who've arrived over the last few years? Um, because we also want to make sure that those who probably have the most need for um, for language accessible information are getting that. And so we added in Kenya, Rwanda, Swahili, French, and Burmese. Um, so those were the seven languages, and I'll say that again, so Spanish, Arabic, Simplified Chinese, Kenya, Rwanda, Swahili, French, and Burmese um, for the COVID pandemic. And then we worked with the governor's office to say, okay, what would you want us to have translated? And they said, we want all executive orders and press releases translated. And we're like, okay. And as the executive orders started coming out, I said to the governor's office, I'm like, yeah, no. <laughs> like, you know, I don't, I don't know if anyone read any of the executive orders that came out, but like the first two or three pages was all the legal reasons why you could have the executive, why you could have the executive order. I'm like, no one's going to read this. Right. So I said, I understand why you think that you need to get them the information and it needs to be the holistic information, but really that's not going to be helpful. We need to know, like, what do people need to know that's in this EO that is, you know, the information that people would want to know. And to be honest, myself as a native born Michigander, I'm like, even for me reading through those, because I read through the EOs before I'd send them off. I'm like, even I don't even understand everything that's in here, right? We really need to make these again, more accessible, more informational for folks. And so we worked with our Michigan Department of Health and Human Services to have them start developing more infographics or one pagers or sometimes broader than one page, but again, really trying to pull out the more pertinent information so that it was more digestible and easier for folks to understand. And again, great partnership with them. They did a phenomenal job. I think once we started explaining to them um, what we thought might be a little bit better um, in terms of some of the um, um, translation that we were working on. Um, we also worked with them to um, dub over some of the town halls that were had. So a lot of the town halls were in English. Um, and so we worked with um, one of our state vendors to have the town halls uh, that, again, take the English version and have the either Spanish or Arabic version dubbed over the top um, so we could disseminate those. Those we did limit to some of the top languages, um, primarily, to be honest, because of cost, as Anissa mentioned, it is, it is costly. Um, and we were trying to be as efficient and as effective as we could. With that said, there were also a number of town halls that were held in language, which was great. Um, and we really appreciated that. So. Um, as I mentioned, we coordinated the translations, not just with our governor's office and the Department of Health and Human Services, but we also did it for really any other agency that needed assistance during that time. So MIOSHA, when they were talking about employment and workplace safety, the unemployment insurance agency, we worked closely with them. Um, unemployment was a huge issue, especially in terms of language access. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, and obviously we are technically still in the pandemic. So although the, the translation work that we're doing is not um, 
as fast and as frequent as it was um, at the height of the pandemic. We are still working with um, the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services on translating information about booster shots and now the children's um, available vaccines for children. Um, what really was um, demonstrated during the beginning of the pandemic was how important the stakeholder groups that we've convened and the partnerships that we've developed over the last six or seven years that our office has been around, how important those were to getting information out into the communities. And not only that, but working with our partners to say, okay, here's the, here's the languages the state's working on. Who can do translations for the Bangladeshi community? Who can do, you know, translations for the Hmong community? Who can do, right? So looking at um, taking our information and saying, here's the seven languages we're doing. How can others fill in in your communities um, with, you know, with translation or interpretation um, for those um, other um, communities? And so um, organizations like the Detroit Immigration Task Force and an organization called Global Detroit and um, the um, International Center in Flint and others took it upon themselves to work with other, you know, translation companies, interpretation companies to get um, uh, information translated into other, under, other languages, which was really great. And not only that, but through the partnerships we've developed, when we would send out those translations, they would then send them out into their network. So we knew we were reaching a much broader community than just those that were on our email list, quote unquote. Um, we also had a website, uh, well, stop, the COVID-19 website, coronavirus website for the state. Um, there was one hiccup to this that they couldn't figure out. Um, we have an alternative language section on the website and the majority of documents that we put up, we made sure that the, the document titles were both in English and in the language. Um, that was something we learned during the Flint water crisis that was really helpful. Um, because again, if you've got information up and it's the English titles up there, that might not be helpful for folks. Um, so at least for most of the translations that our office did, we didn't coordinate hundred percent of the translations during the, during the current pandemic, but we did a lot of them. Um, we made sure that those document titles, again, were both in English and in the language. Um, again, so a lot about accessibility. Um, Specifically with our unemployment insurance agency, one of the things that was highlighted during the pandemic is the need for more plain language. And really, this is true, in my opinion, across the board with our state agency partners. Um, there's a lot of documentation and information applying for benefits or um, that is, there's a lot of jargon included in the information and that jargon doesn't necessarily translate. Um, and so people have a very hard time understanding what is asked of them or what documentation they're supposed to be providing. And so we held a few stakeholder meetings with our unemployment insurance agency um, during the pandemic to let them hear from our stakeholders about what were some of their concerns. And one of the things that the unemployment insurance agency started to do was hold um, listening sessions where they would provide um, forms in what they would consider to be more plain language, but they were looking for feedback from partners on, does this information make sense? Do you understand what this says? And again, as a native born Michigander, I was looking at some of those employment insurance letters that people got and you don't understand what they say. Um, and so, you know, again, if you don't understand it as a native born English person, how is anyone going to understand it when that's translated? So again, really trying to make sure that our state agency partners understand that, they need to try and use plain language or clear language when they're trying to describe whatever the benefit or service might be. Um, we also assisted the unemployment insurance agency during the pandemic. They created and launched both a Spanish and Arabic line for service. Um, and so we worked with them on the phrasing and the translations for the phrasing for their, um, for their telephonic lines. Um, finally, we do a lot of general advocacy for language access across state government. Um, so we advocate with our state agency partners for them to create language access plans if they don't currently have them. Um, we talk about how you do that. We talk about language access requirements. We talk about best practices when it comes to language access. Um, we talk about how if you're uh, an agency that maybe receives, um, to, to what Anissa was saying, it's, it's really a, a, it's not a state requirement, but a federal requirement. If a program receives federal dollars, they're required to uh, provide meaningful access, uh, meaningful language access. Um, this was an executive order signed by President Bill Clinton over 20 years ago, I think 21 years ago now. Um, and so we talk with our state agency partners who may get those federal dollars, but then subgrant that out to others. What does that look like in terms of language access and how are you 
um, ensuring that language access is being provided by those counties, cities, nonprofits, right, who are getting those federal dollars that funnel through the state. Um, and then we um, have hold a, a number of stakeholder meetings with our partners and state agencies around the importance and impact of language access. Um, and one of the things that we're doing for this coming fiscal year is developing kind of a um, uh, a speaker series, if you will, and part of that will focus on language access and best practices, again, to really try and help our state agency partners understand um, why language access is important. And as I said before, language like interpretation and translation does not necessarily equal language access and helping them understand why that might be true. Um, and so, that, again, that's a, a lot of the work that we do. Um, and we believe that all goes back to that one of the main points of our office, which is striving to provide more equitable access to state level services and programming. And then finally, um, I did not bring any data information. I, I am not great at remembering data per se, but I will leave you with this. Um, there's two really great resources, um, especially around um, state level data for Michigan. Um, one is um, our friends and partners at the New American Economy. Um, if you just Google New American Economy map the impact um, they have state level data for every state across the country. You can also break it down by U.S. congressional district. And there's a whole host of different information around international students and entrepreneurs and languages and um, economic impact, uh, et cetera. And then um, in terms of some of the um, um, English proficiency, we really like to look at the state profile data of the data of the Migration Policy Institute. So if you're not familiar with MPI, um, if you just Google Migration Policy Institute, when you get into their website, there's a search bar and you can say state data profiles and their link will pop up for that. And again, they have profiles for every state and it talks about, you know, um, background and languages spoken in the home and English proficiency and educational background. It's tons of information. Um, and so those are two really good um, sites that we use often for um, data. So I will also stop there because I think I've done my 15 minutes and I will turn it back to you. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you so much, Karen. Um, That's very informative. Um, so um, our third and final speaker is uh, Bilal Hamoud. Uh, Bilal is a lifelong resident of Michigan. Uh, serving as a public engagement associate for the Michigan Department of State, Hamoud was appointed by Secretary of State uh, Jocelyn Benson as the first Arab American to work in the executive office. His efforts are centered around policy reform, public education, and statewide, statewide ID and election resource creation for marginalized communities, including housing insecurity, returning citizens, and seniors. Additionally, Hamoud chairs the Secretary of State's Language Access Task Force, leading statewide accessibility initiatives for non-English speaking communities. Beginning his career in academia, Hamoud earned two degrees in public health and neuropsychology from Wayne State University. Continuing to serve as a data-driven advocate in Southeast Michigan, Hamoud received the Contributor of the Year Award from the Michigan League of Conservation Voters for his environmental and public education work. In his previous roles, he served as the project manager for the city of Sheboygan, Community Engagement Liaison um, with Forgotten Harvest and Community Relations Manager with Communities First Incorporated. Hamoud currently serves on several nonprofit boards, including Reaching uh, Our Children, United Humanitarian Foundation, and Dama for Humanity. The title of Bilal's talk is Language Access as a Fundamental Component of Government. Thank you, Bilal. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the University of Michigan, uh, Graham, uh, Dr. Khalid and uh, Hassan, thank you guys for bringing this together and moderating. And also thankful to our two other panelists here, uh, Karen and Anissa. Karen and I work together very much, and uh, Anissa is one of our strongest partners with Access and the work that they do, absolutely fundamental towards supporting the Arab American community. Uh, so uh, just to give you a little bit of background on myself, I am a uh, a Lebanese American. Uh, my parents came here a year before I was born, um, and they immigrated into Detroit. Uh, typical immigrant fashion. We lived right off of Warren with about uh, three other of my family. So my cousins, uncles, about 20, 25 people all rambunctiously living in one household for a few years. It was a good time. And then a few years in, we moved to Dearborn Heights, and I've been living there ever since. Um, so uh, one of my younger sisters is actually supposed to be in attendance here today. But in typical uh, Arab American fashion, um, is late. But that's okay, Rida. This one's for you. Hopefully, uh, you'll watch this later. But um, a lot of my work, uh, being in the Department of State, has centered around 
uh, better enabling non-English speaking communities. So um, the public engagement department, just to give you an idea, was something that started uh, with the new administration, Jocelyn Benson's administration, as a way to better engage the, the public, better educate, better connect with the, the people who we serve. And this is especially important for our state agency because if you look at all the different state departments, who interacts with the most residents on a day-to-day -day basis? Your local secretary of state branch. So it was important that we're being proactive in educating communities on how to better access state resources. So I came in about two years ago and uh, after the pandemic hit, that was our big wake up call that we really needed to push aggressively to make our uh, resources more language accessible. Um, so at that time, back in around uh, April or May, Jocelyn Benson started the Language Access Task Force and appointed me uh, the chair so that we could better engage folks on a level that was beyond just a press release. You know, the EOs and the press releases are one way to communicate with the public, but really that barely gets to us, let alone individuals from a non-traditional community. So we're talking about really getting into those WhatsApp group chats. That's the only way you know that you've gotten information into the hands of folks that, that need to see it, into those cracks. Um, so we talk about uh, what was the Language Access Task Force. It was a culmination of about 50 different state agencies, settlement agencies, nonprofits, and individuals who worked on the ground with those different non-English speaking communities. And this covered communities from Bengali speaking individuals, uh, Korean, Mandarin, Arabic, Spanish, uh, Burmese, all the different prominent communities in Michigan that were non-English speaking and trying to make sure that they had access not only to our, uh, our Secretary of State resources like IDs, vehicle records and everything in that category, but the other half of what we do, which is the fun stuff, elections. And so when we're talking about being engaged in a, on a level that is more than just participatory, really taking on that extra step of responsibility and the first thing you're given as a, uh, when you become a citizen, when you become naturalized, is that voter registration form. It's that civic engagement. So back in 2018, you might be familiar, Michigan went from one of the worst states for voting access to one of the best. The new Voting Rights Act was passed, and it really gave us an opportunity to um, better connect with these non-traditional voters. Um, so during the 2020 election, we shifted gears completely, and the Language Access Task Force was hyper-focused on ensuring that these communities had the updated information on how they could participate, how they could register to vote on the same day and vote. And that's something that wasn't possible before. And if you're telling someone who comes from at least my community that you can wait till the last minute and still vote, they love that. And that, <laughs> that showed. We saw huge increases in non-traditional voter participation in 2020 and in this 2021 primary, which I'll get to something I'm very excited uh, about. Um, but what we did was we created non-English uh, voter education events. So the first ever in-language Arabic voter education event where the entire thing was in Arabic. And we did one in the Yemeni dialect to better target that community, which faces its own levels of marginalization within the Arab American uh, population. We talk about uh, some of the initiatives that translated all of our voter materials. So voter registration forms, absentee ballot applications, and more all to enable these communities to better engage at that level. One of my favorite things that we did, uh, which had longstanding effects, was a pilot program, which I led to translate our sample ballots into Arabic, Spanish, and Bengali. Um, one of the things I'll talk about as well is how there isn't any Arabic uh, voting materials on any level, and that's because of the lack of representation that we have on the census. But we created these materials uh, for Dearborn, uh, uh, Hamtramck, uh, Detroit, uh, Pontiac, and Dearborn Heights. But this was a way to better uh, serve these five communities that we saw high non-English speaking populations. And through this program, folks realized that, hey, we're entitled to these materials. And in 2021, there was a huge push to the cl local clerk's offices to get these uh, non-English uh, materials, to get uh, sample ballots in Arabic. And the community got a taste of what they were entitled to. And that was amazing because now they were willing to fight for it. Now they knew that they weren't just, you know, relegated to the sidelines, but were a centerpiece of the election process. Uh, so uh, just to talk a little bit about um, the other things that we do with ID services, 
we try to better enable people at our state branches. We're hosting a series of service-driven workshops to better connect people with all of our online services. And one of my favorite things that we have is the yellow terminals uh, you may have seen at the different Kroger's and Myers. These self-service stations are one of our best ways to engage with you know, all of our services that we provide because they're available in Arabic, Spanish, Bengali, Mandarin, and Vietnamese. And we're working on getting them into two additional languages. So this is a, a machine that you can go grocery shopping and then take care of all your vehicle taps, ID red renewals, almost every service you could do at a branch minus taking a photo and taking a test. So this is a great way of starting to access that state government without uh, and making that part of the norm. Um, but we hop into elections again, right? And this is really where I would like to talk about what, uh, what it means to have representation. And so specifically for my community, for the Arab American community, we know that the census doesn't have a checkbox for us. That Middle East, North African checkbox that we fought so hard for and was stricken away at the last minute had huge ramifications. It's not just data, but waves of impacts, including, uh, as Anissa mentioned, federal voting rights protections, federal protections, funding. Funding is huge. How much of our community doesn't get that specialized funding? Our schools, uh, in Dearborn Heights, we have the Crestwood School District, which just a decade ago had about five, 10% Arab American population. It's now at 85%. In 10 years, it's it's gone up to 85% concentration. And a school district like this would be entitled to 40% more funding per student. Imagine what a school could do with that sort of, uh, those sort of resources. But again, because of that little checkbox, Title I, Title II, Title IV, none of these resources can come in. And where it impacts us and the work that I do, and really a, like a sizable chunk of the work I do, is just filling in the gaps that these waves of impacts have had. So we talk about the Federal Voting Rights Act, which mandates that every community that has a certain speaking, uh, non-English speaking population is entitled to voter materials in their language. And that means everything. That means posters. That means all the uh, election materials leading up to the election, the voter registration forms and the ballots themselves. You should be able to vote and go through the entire process without skipping a beat and do it the same way someone else who's English speaking can do. And that doesn't exist for the Arabic speaking population because of that census, uh, because of that lack of census representation. That 5% marker that you're supposed to reach, which uh, in a city like Dearborn is met well and beyond, is, is, it doesn't matter. And so even with a 50% Arab American population, we don't get those resources. And so we have to, again, fight for the representation and really what is our only option? Uh, we have a decade to wait before we get on the, the census again, and then we can start collecting those resources. It's not going to be enough. So there is this huge gap that we have to continuously fight to fill. Um, one of the things that uh, uh, Karen did not mention was the uh, Afghan arrivals, something that has been absolutely incredible uh, to work alongside uh, Global Michigan and the work that all of our state agencies and resettlement agencies have really done. So in the past few months, we've received about, what was it, 1,300, 1,400? We're going to receive a total of 1,600. Sorry, I overlooked that. That's my daily life lately is Afghan arrivals. Um, but yeah, <laughs> Michigan's going to receive about 1,600 Afghan arrivals. Um, we so far have about 250 in the state um, with more coming every day. And the goal from the federal government is to have them all in, in state by mid-February or before. Yeah. So in the next few months, we're going to be seeing huge waves of new communities coming in. And because of the status that they've received, not the refugee status, but uh, remind me of the acronym. I see humanitarian parole is how they're being entered into the country. They're not entitled to a lot of the state resources that a normal refugee might receive. And so this culmination of efforts by state agencies, resettlement agencies and nonprofit groups has kind of showcased what it's like when you reach across the aisle, when you reach across the silos of state government and work collaboratively, you can supplement the legal resources and supplement the housing resources, the food resources. And now these arrivals are receiving some of the best treatment that refugees, asylum seekers, or anyone coming to the state could receive because of this culmination of efforts. So it shows what is possible. And recreating that for all of our communities is something that um, I think this has opened up the conversation to. Uh, we're talking about representation, that census data, what it means. 
what about redistricting? Uh, how many of you here are familiar with the redistricting process mm -hmm. currently occurring in Michigan? Can I see some hands? Okay. So uh, just to give you an idea, the redistricting process that's happening now is part of a decade long process to redraw the maps that represent or that encompass how you're represented. So basically, if your district looks like this, like this, or like, you know, the really squiggly line going from Dearborn to Ann Arbor, isn't it weird that we have the same congressperson <laughs> all the way from Dearborn to Ann Arbor? But it's basically an anti gerrymandering effort that happened uh, as part of that 2018 push as a Michigan Independent Citizens Redistricting Commission. So now 13 individuals who are randomly selected will determine how these district lines are drawn. And that's huge. That means that we're going to have a conscious effort to better enable these communities to have representation. One of the top criteria by which they draw these maps is uh, communities of interest, which is a vague term, but basically gives communities like ours an opportunity to have that representation. But in the final hour, they're looking at census data to determine what communities need to be represented and how. And that means that a community like Dearborn is then being paired with a community like Detroit because we show up as white on the census. And that ends up hurting both communities. So it pits, ultimately pits two marginalized communities against each other for representation. So now we're in this battle of also trying to fight for representation on the legislative side. Because if we don't have it on the federal side, and we don't have it on the legislative side, we only have it on the local side and we're forced to try and leak out into the broader uh, spectrum. So having that representation and pushing for that sort of uh, districts that give us a fair chance is part of this, this ongoing fight. And again, that what happens with that lack of census representation. Um, and we've seen in 2021, you know, I mentioned how big the 2020 elections were, but 2021 was even bigger. We saw the largest number of non-traditional candidates run for office ever in Michigan's history. We saw, I think, three Muslim mayors uh, who were elected into Dearborn, Dearborn Heights, and Hamtramck. We saw the largest number of Arab American voters come out. And that was huge because now we know that we are a sizable chunk. We have a voice. And now we're worth pandering to. Whether that's a good thing or not, we're now worth coming to for our voice at the table. And we're no longer on the menu. We're no longer um, this victimized group, but this group that is willing to stand up and willing to fight and willing to seek out that sort of uh, that representation. Uh, so uh, one thing, so I'm not sure how much time I have. Yeah. One thing I want to leave you all with is uh, something that, something I experienced back when I was in uh, Lebanon in 2006. We were visiting with my family and uh, I was there for about a few weeks before the war broke out. Um, and it was a reminder that, you know, there isn't much to go back to. We've immigrated to this country for opportunity, for, new, for a new chance to, to build our families and to build our generational support, our generational knowledge, our generational wealth. And there isn't much for us back home. There's some family, but it's difficult to look back. It's bittersweet to look back. And back when I was there in 2006, and the war broke out and we had to flee. I was a refugee in my own country. We had to flee because the airport had been bombed and we, we literally could not leave. So we had to take a, we actually got two options, a military dinghy or a cruise ship to go over to Cyprus. We got the cruise ship, which was pretty nice. But we had to take a cruise ship over to Cyprus and stay in the camps. And finally, we were able to fly home after weeks of this process. And my father, who wasn't with us on this trip, hasn't returned back since the war, or since uh, he left and came here. My father can't sit and watch the news without getting mad and yelling at the politicians. And my parents, when they found out I was getting involved in government <laughs> work, were like, no, 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 that's not effective. You can't do anything. It, it kind of shows their mentality and that, that fear of, of corruption, that fear that comes from their former country and why it's so important to make that election process as transparent and as engaging as possible, because you have to be proactive to get them to feel included in the system. And so one thing that uh, a great speaker once said that has resonated with me is, it's great to be the first, right? Like the Prophet Muhammad, he was the first Muslim, peace be upon him, and that was great. 
But what made him amazing was that he wasn't the last. And it's so important that all these firsts we're seeing in our state, in our country, aren't the last. And that's that continual fight. That's what the continual representation battle that we have. And that's the work that I do with the Michigan Department of State and how it translates into my activism work and the work that I'll continue to do throughout my, my career. So I'm really glad to be here with you all today to share that work alongside such great partners and looking forward to continuing the conversation. So thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, Bilal. And thank you to our panelists. And speaking of uh, continuing the conversation, I guess we can open the floor to any questions that you might have for any of the panelists individually or collectively. For those of you watching online, uh, please feel free to write some questions in the Q&A and um, we will try to get to you. And uh, we're gonna come and pass around a microphone to those of you here in the audience with us. But uh, if, Hassan, if you want to get us started with a question. Yeah. I, I do have a question. I thought I saw Ali had you had your hand raised. Well, uh, no, I, I well, um, you know, um, um, Khaled actually alluded to this in his uh, um, opening remarks about um, kind of like um, the, the fear of questions, right? And um, um, and I wonder if you all wanted to kind of discuss like how to navigate um, people's fear of. Uh, of uh, federal agencies, that uh, their understandable anxiety uh, in dealing with uh, federal agencies. Um, um, Karen, in your talk, you mentioned about, when you were talking about the Flint water crisis, you mentioned about trying to minimize federal involvement, right? Uh, knowing that um, some inhabitants of, of Flint might be averse to communication if they know the, the federal agency is involved. So I wonder if you wanted to maybe um, and, and that about um, you know the, the fight for representation too. And I wonder, does um, does the fear that people might have, not all people obviously, but some anxiety that they might have when it comes to federal agencies, does that kind of impede you know this fight for representation, or how do you navigate that? How you, how do you circumvent that? I'll start briefly. Um, I would actually say it's both a fear and mistrust, and I would actually include state government in that as well. Um, I, I, I think there sometimes is more of a fear of federal um, agencies, I think for some obvious reasons, especially on the enforcement piece. Um, but one of the reasons we've developed such strong partnerships is because even if it's information that our office is sending out, if it's coming from one of their trusted partners, so if it's coming from... Um, you know, again, the West Michigan Asian Association, or if it's coming from Access, or if it's coming from the Michigan Immigrant Rights Center, or one of our other many partners around the state, people may be more likely to trust that information. And so we're very well aware that just because of the work we're trying to do, that doesn't mean people are going to trust the government. And so that's where we, again, really try and utilize the strength of our partnerships to help us reinforce whatever that might be that we're doing, whether it's a state government initiative or even a federal government initiative, um, you know, we try and really use those partnerships and those trusted voices to help. Um, I mean, and during the COVID pandemic, that was, it's been huge to try and use trusted voices um, for folks to get information and make sure they're getting quality information and accurate information. Um, you know, just understanding when you may be seen as a trusted voice and understanding when you may not be. Yeah. And just to add to that, that that's the value of building a genuine relationship with the community is being and just establishing that trusted relationship because uh, again press release isn't going to get there it needs to be simplified language and it needs to come from a community partner who has been engaging with that community so part of the language access task force is to create translate and distribute those materials through those traditional means and non-traditional means like the whatsapp group chats the new michigan media and all those other outlets um, i think that is a tribute to the state and federal agencies in terms of trust um, only here can we be a little bit more intentional but at the federal side uh, without that representation it's hard to see that that trust being built and i just wanted to add that um you know for organizations who are on the ground and closest to communities um they're a lot more in tune about you know what the you know if there's misinformation and what that 
misinformation looks like so that we can, you know, be proactive about that. You know, one thing that comes to mind is when a public charge was in effect, there was so much misinformation around that to the point where some families thought that they can't take advantage of, you know, the free meals in schools or they can't enroll their children in Head Start. And we just, you know, we did so much work around that just to let them know, you know, what it is, what it isn't, and then to let them know it's no, no longer in effect. So there's there's quite a bit of that happening as well, you know, in partnership with, with the state and, and others. Yeah, I, I would just uh, add one more thing. We, uh, Anissa and I heard an interesting story last night um, from Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib. Apparently, she worked as a uh, administrative assistant with Access way back in the day. So it shows how a community org like that can really set the foundation for that federal representation. So it kind of just ties everything uh, together pretty nicely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. yeah. Thank you all for your presentation. That was great. It's on. Is it on? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about the WhatsApp. So my question is for Bilal. Uh, Bilal, you mentioned the ballots issue, mm -hmm. and that's something as a journalist I've witnessed firsthand. At any given election, uh, I witness on a day at least 20, 30 uh, elderly Arab Americans specifically uh, struggling to fill out their ballots mm -hmm. and looking for help for someone to come and help them. Uh, and it's it's a form of voter suppression. What would it take uh, for a place like Dearborn to get Arabic ballots? Great question. Thank you for asking. Um, so uh, let me backtrack a little. Is one of the efforts that we did back in 2020 was to recruit poll workers, but not only poll workers to support our clerk and supplement them during the pandemic, but bilingual poll workers, so that the face you see at the election, uh, at the polling booth, at the uh, clerk's office was familiar and could help you uh, engage with that system and to vote. Um, but that doesn't solve the full issue, right? Um, those sample ballots were great because people could compare next to their uh, regular ballot, but they still had to compare. And that's an extra step, an extra barrier. So like I mentioned, we don't get those ballot translations like a city like Hamtramck does for the Bengali speaking population because we don't have that census representation. But what we can do is tackle it through several different approaches. There's state government, right? We can go through the legislator and try to pass a bill that uh, basically, similar to California fashion, uh, supplements the Federal Voting Rights Act and adds that additional criteria and just include Arabic as one of the speaking populations and use a source that isn't necessarily uh, census data. The other way is through local municipal government, right? Which is the clerk deciding that this is something they wanna do. And this is actually an initiative we're working on now to help enable clerks to have the tools they need to, to translate their ballots, their voter materials. And we looked at the total cost to program the machines, to translate the ballots, and to uh, make sure that they're posted and printed out. And the cost for Dearborn, Dearborn Heights, Hamtramck, Melvindale, all these communities where you see densely populated uh, Arabic speaking populations, it's like $15,000. It's so cheap. It's really, really affordable. And for an, uh, uh, any clerk's office to be able to afford that for an election cycle, even if it's once every general, once every other general, it is so it is so affordable that there should there really isn't an excuse. But that is not a mandate. It's not a mandate through a city charter. It's not a mandate through state government, through county government. And so it is at the discretion of the clerk at the end of the day. And the work that we do with the Department of State and the work that is being done on the ground here, policy changes are great. But policy changes are dependent on the administration. And unless something is mandated through legislation, it is possible to flip it back. And that's not something we can leave uh, to chance, right? The clerk of Dearborn doesn't currently translate the ballots into Arabic, and that's up to his discretion. It can be done. There's a path for it to be done, especially in Wayne County, but it, they're not. And so we can't leave that up to chance. So what we've done and what we're trying to do, and this is, this is a little bit under the radar, but we're trying to go through the county. If we can lobby the county rep uh, representatives, the county commissioners, to mandate that their local municipalities meet that Federal Voting Rights Act 
standard, even uh, more uh, a more uh, loose criteria that three percent, which is that new best practices that we're seeing in California, instead of that five percent, and include the Arabic speaking population, that'll entitle Detroit to Spanish ballots, which is a shock it doesn't have at this point. Hamtramck, Dearborn, Dearborn Heights, Melvindale, all these municipalities entitled to Arabic ballots. So if we can take this county approach and the commission signs on, we don't have to wait for the discretion of the state legislator or the local municipalities. We can mandate this and make this part of the standard. Um, so that is our current strategy, low-key strategy that we're working on to develop, but trying to, to make that the, um, the avenue to get those translated ballots. As you're right, it, it's a huge barrier and it should be part of the norm. Hi. Yes, thank you so much for all of your presentations. Uh, I have a, a few questions, actually. Um, so, Bilal, were you saying that there's an, a minimum population level for a community to be entitled to the translation of the ballots into its language? Yeah, so I should clarify. I oversimplified it just a bit. There needs to be a 5% threshold of non-English speaking individuals from that community within a jurisdiction with a municipality in order to qualify. And how do they determine whether that threshold has been met? Census data. Yeah. So that doesn't help us at this point, right? Not at all. No. So you're saying that, <laughs> so in order to overcome this barrier, we have to, um, we have to change the laws. We have to change the laws and change the identify, how we identify the Arab American population. So the census is one avenue. That's a decade long battle. But until then, probably lawsuits are going to be the avenue that this community has to take oh, in order to yeah. ensure federal representation and those protections. Wow. Okay. Uh, I had another question about your voter education mm -hmm. events. Uh, so those were held, you had voter education events in Arabic. Mm -hmm. um, is there a way that for example, I'm from the Chicago area. Is there a way that we could find out how to model things like that from you? Yeah. Um, so we have a language access page on the Michigan Department of State that kind of has the outline okay. toolkits, resources, and everything there. So okay. that can be set as a maybe a standard model. Okay. Um, but one thing that we've um, taken the model of California for is, I actually didn't announce this, we're going to be translating all of our websites into seven different languages, Arabic, Spanish, Bengali, Mandarin, Vietnamese, Pashto, mm. um, and French to accommodate the African uh, uh, languages or African regions. Okay. So it's not only that, but all of our documents as well um, on our website will be translated. That's coming in the next maybe month or so. So really excited for that. Um, thanks for giving me Great. the opportunity to okay. share that. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much for this extraordinary panel. Um, I was thinking about Khaled's opening remarks um, that the trans, um, translation is also happening among the different Arab American communities that they are translating themselves to each other. And I was thinking about that in particular with Anissa's um, reference to the Yemeni community and how they are marginalized within um, among the other Arab American communities and how you see that playing out right now at Access through the Youth and Education Division? So, you know, um, one of the things that we do is we always, always make sure that um, we regularly inventory the number of dialects or who speaks what dialects because, you know, um, just going back to what I said earlier, you know, we could have someone who speaks the Arabic language, even standard Arabic, but that's just, it's not going to work with, with you know, um, a new immigrant Yemeni um, individual or family. So just making sure that we have individuals who speak the, you know, different dialects, I can't stress just how important it is. Because when we think of dialects here in the US, you know, we all still understand each other, you know, we understand someone from the South very well, you know, it's not the case with with Arabic, you know, you could be speaking 
the Yemeni dialect or the Rocky dialect or Lebanese dialect. And, you know, it almost seems like a different language. So, you know, making sure that we have individuals who speak the dialects and then, you know, fully being aware that the information, the written information sense, because that is in standard Arabic, you know, that that's just, it's not enough. We know that we still have to, you know, further explain um, various things. I don't know if that answers your, your question. And then working with the schools as well, you know, making sure that they understand those, those distinctions and those, you know, nuances and, um, you know, uh, reaching out to them to let them know we, you know, we can help them when they have their, you know, um, parent teacher conferences, for example, or, you know, other meetings, we, we offer them individuals who speak the various dialects, you know, if they don't have those. I'm just curious about the recruiting, for example, of Yemeni translators or who are thinking about translating between dialects. How are they trained? How are they thinking about not only a language issue, but as you say, a cultural and contextual issue? In terms of the translators, those they have to be certified. Our translators are, are all certified um, for translating documents. And, uh, and those are obviously in you know standard Arabic. Um, but in terms of individuals who interpret um, they don't go through a formal training. We just, you know, um, sort of know who speaks the dialect well enough and is able to, you know, effectively interpret. And, and again, just knows the background of the families and also um, can switch back and forth between there are dialects within within dialects. And, you know, there are certain individuals that are actually able to switch back and forth and some who are just very, you know, speak a specific dialect very well only. Hi, I have a, actually a, a, a series of maybe three questions, but first comment on, um, uh, on the dialect issue. And this is not to generate uh, or to sort of generalize, but I think the, the, the need for uh, Focus in dialect has to do maybe with levels of literacy, even within Arabic. Uh, people who are not fully literate uh, are much closer to their dialect. Uh, Arabic is, in fact, in fact, there sort of narrowly there is the moderate standard Arabic, but then also with television and satellite uh, dish, dish and, and channels and so on, uh, internet. Um, uh, there, people, even Moroccan Arabic, which is really difficult, has been heard through Arabic television, Al Jazeera, and so on. Uh, and that even that is becoming to be sort of available and understood by others. So the, the and then there is, of course, um, there is maybe the fact that these Arabs that are from different countries that are speaking, uh, code switching, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, so, in a sense, the, the the gaps between the dialects have made to do with uh, literacy, uh, but the fact that Arabic dialects are, uh, you, you could actually have three layers. You could have the Arabic modern standard if you're literate in it. You could speak an Arabic that other dialects can understand and that you could speak your uh, uh, dialect, which is never really pure. There, there's never a dialect that's so pure. Um, so there's the, the, these kinds of uh, levels. So I'm not sure. I'm sure if you're not dealing with people who uh, have difficulty with literacy, uh, translation becomes much more focused on dialect and uh, presents a challenge. So that's maybe perhaps a challenge. The other, um, so that's a comment. The question is um, uh, translation and maybe uh, law enforcement. Um, in prisons, um, in, uh, with uh, juveniles, if, if they are needed, maybe you can speak to how that happens. Um, again, I can't really say maybe Ali knows uh, more on what is happening with Arab Americans in this region or other regions with law enforcement. Uh, of course, we saw, speaking of the federal ICE uh, situation with a lot of these Iraqis uh, who were being returned. Um, so uh, what is happening there in terms of uh, translations in the realm of law enforcement, uh, confidentiality, conversations with lawyers, uh, how, you know, sort of the tension that uh, if you can speak to us. So we're taking you to sort of more difficult neighborhoods because 
the, slightly the impression has been very positive when the situation might be a little darker. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask um, uh, for maybe Anissa as um, somebody who is a, a kind of a, 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 metaphorically speaking, a kind of translator of the community. Uh, the idea is maybe uh, sort of kind of one directional. You're maybe taking information from the state and sort of pouring it into the community. Uh, in some ways, how do you work the other way around? What is your role as a, as a translator of the community's wishes to the state official? I mean, I think the government would like you to have a one-way bridge of information, but you have to, and when do you push back? When do you say, you know, what you're asking me to do as a, as a mediator, a translator, uh, is just not something that uh, I'm going to do for you. So that's one question. And finally, uh, also in Arabic as a cultural tool or maybe translation as a tool, we think of it as also a tool of assimilation. Uh, we'll help you with Arabic ballots, with this information, so that you can be sort of assimilated and adjusted. Uh, and of course, the assumption is that, you, in a way, we'll use Arabic to help you cut your connection with home. Uh, how can we think of Arabic as a way actually to inform the um, larger community really about the diversity of it? The one day I will never forget, which is hearing an Arabic song on uh, uh, the Garrison Keeler show. Uh, from they, they had a show in Detroit and they brought this. It wasn't a very good song or <laughs> band, but it was such a, because I'd heard that show for 30 years and not a mention of Arabs or anything, but Garrison Keeler brought this band from Dearborn and they performed. And Arabic was recognized as part of the larger uh, Detroit area and as part of the America. But in a, in a sense, so when can Arabic be brought in as part of this, um, of an indicator of diversity and multiplicity and acceptance rather than a tool for assimilation? So these are my three questions. Um, law enforcement, let's go into these dark neighborhoods. Your role, Anissa, and access as a mediator. And then why is Arabic only a tool of assimilation? Why can it be a tool of wider uh, sense of uh, acceptance and diversity? Thank if, you. If it's okay, I'm going to jump in before Anissa answers because I unfortunately have to leave. Okay. I've got a, a one o'clock meeting I have got to be back for. So um, I just wanted to put in a couple of points to some of those questions. Um, I don't know with regard to prison specifically, but in terms of law enforcement, our office worked with the Michigan State Police last year to develop a new policy for them around um, interpretation availability for like traffic stops or routine stops. Um, the um, Michigan State Police, not always, but had sometimes been um, putting out a call for any local interpreters and then ICE or CBP, if they were in the area, they would come and interpret. Um, and so we worked with the Michigan State Police to say, no, right? That's not, that should not be your first line of language access. You need, you've got a, a language line or, you know, again, we've got state vendors that we have to use for interpretation and translation. Um, and so through those contracts, we have access to a language line type services and that's who the Michigan State Police should be um, using. So if you go to the Michigan State Police's website, and I think you can just even type in immigration policy, it'll pull up what the new policy is that was released again in 2020. Um, and then just briefly in terms of access, um, and I, Nisa can speak more clearly, I just wanted to let you know for us, you know, access, access has been a close partner of ours for a long time. And um, they do actually, I think they even have some state services that are even housed right in their facility. Um, and so there's a lot of, of, two-way communication and two-way partnership. Um, and we do a lot too with sharing information about access. I'm very proud to say that I received my COVID-19 my COVID um, vaccines from access, um, from their vaccine shot clinics. Um, we do a lot of sharing of information about their programming and their activities um, with our partners. Um, and we do that with all of our partners. And I apologize again for having to leave, but actually it's an Afghan arrival meeting I have to be at for <laughs> one o'clock. So um, thank you so much. I will leave a couple of business cards up here. So if folks had questions and I didn't get to them, please feel free to reach out. Thanks. So 
But yeah, Karen's absolutely right. You know, we have the Department of Health and Human Services co-located at Access. Um, Secretary of State does does work um, at Access as well. And, you know, part of it is because of the language access, but part of it too is, you know, community-based organizations um, tend to be, you know, trusted entities and, you know, they know for sure, although they can get access to, you know, interpreters um, in these other state agencies, they know for sure that they can get that um, at access. So that's been a really, really great um, partnership. Just briefly going back to um, Dr. Khaled, what you, what you talked about in terms of, you know, um, dialects and, you know, the, the impact of TVs and movies being in various dialects. I think just going back to the earlier, earlier question about the difficulties of, you know, finding individuals who, um, you know, tr uh, translate or interpret the Yemeni dialect. I think it's because of that lack of representation. You know, there aren't that many movies in that dialect. So while, you know, um, Yemenis are able to understand the various dialects because of the movies and TV and so on, um, the uh, the reverse doesn't, doesn't happen. So, you know, I think that's why it's so important to make sure that we do have individuals who, who speak the Yemeni uh, dialect. Um, and, uh, in terms of the, you know, our role in, uh, in, in translations, you know, we get a lot of documents, as Karen said, we get a lot of documents from the state. A lot of them are translated in the Arabic language. Um, we are still finding ourselves um, being asked to interpret those documents, translate those documents. What do, what do those mean? You know, and actually breaking it down for individuals, again, because they might be illiterate in their own language. So, you know, we need to be able to, you know, break down that jargon and make sure that, you know, effective communication is happening. So, you know, we, we do a lot of that. A lot of it is verbal for the reason that you, you stated. Um, individuals might be illiterate in their own language. So we found ourselves, you know, having to do that quite a bit, especially in times of crisis. You know, one of the reasons why Access um, opened up a, a drive through one of the first um, organizations to um, do drive through COVID testing is because we knew there was so much fear and we felt like if we were doing it our, at our centers, we're more likely to bring individuals in and answer questions in whatever, you know, language or, or dialect is, is spoken. Um, so I know I'm going quickly here because I know we're out of time, but I hope that at least answers part of your questions along with uh, the law enforcement one. Uh, one last word. Um, well, you know, um, thank you all for being here. And as I said, there's still so much work to be done. But as you've heard, so much is happening. Like I've seen so much just within the past five years than I've, than I've ever seen. And I think there's, you know, um, a much better understanding about you know, quality of translation, quality of interpretation. So it's not just, you know, going through the motions and checking off that box. Yes, we did, in fact, do this. Did this because, you know, federal law says that we do, but it's, you know, truly making sure that um, the language access is is of quality and and really is removing barriers, you know, again, not just as a as a checkoff. So I'm, I'm really optimistic. Yeah, uh, I couldn't agree more with that. And seeing the progress we've made as a community, as a culture uh, in the past five years, uh, even in the past like two, three years, Dearborn had no coffee shops. And now we've got like four Yemeni coffee shops and the Adene Chai, you can't get anything better. You'll be up for four days though. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but it, it really is it, it, this movement that's going to be a continual fight. It's being proactive. It's being efficient, but it's also being evergreen, making sure that these are sustainable solutions that last outside of us, outside of our administrations and are something that become part of the norm, fundamentally part of the way that we do business and interact with with that, with residents. Doesn't seem to be sort of travel further out. Uh, and I'm wondering if there is any thing, aspect of the political cultural work to actually sort of let the rest of the state know that there are living languages spoken again to just break up that sort of one way traffic that I'm talking about. Uh, not, not to dwindle on it too long, but I, I'm sure the recent elected mayors of all these cities are going to be a good way of, of promoting that as well as uh, 
knowing that there is this like traditional avenue that a lot of Arab Americans follow. They start in the South End. Everything starts in the South End. Then you move into like the West Dearborn, Dearborn Heights, Canton, Farmington, and you slowly spread outside of that initial circle where every everything started. Um, so I think that's one way that it's been done. We know there's pockets of Arab Americans everywhere, um, especially in Michigan. And so whether it's the west side of the state in Grand Rapids, whether it's up in Flint or whether it's in Southeast Michigan, we know we're there. And so promoting that culture and being confident in oneself and um, not assimilating and retaining that culture um, is, is going to be that big push that we have to fight for. I think uh, culturally speaking, we see a lot of times that folks will immigrate over and first and second generation immigrants will be so afraid of assimilation that they'll be even more uh, uh, strict in their approach to retain that culture because of the fear of losing it. And so I think there's a hybrid between the two where we're, we're being a part of the community, we're integrating into the fabric of society and establishing ourselves in media. You know how much I love to see that the Arab American Orchestra is coming into town tonight and they're going to be performing and that's a thing. Uh, being a part of the foundational fabric of the society is the way we're going to find ourselves part of that. Um, and so wherever it may be, where a geographic or otherwise, whatever medium of media it's going to be, uh, we're seeing more and more of that exponentially. And that's, that's what I love. Thank you. Thank you.